Uh, looks like it's 6.32, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, Clerk, could you please call the roll? Goss. Harper. Here. Here. King. Here. Lakshin. Here. McGuire. Here. Michaels. Pasalacqua. Here. Paul. Rodriguez. Here. Store. Straub. Here. Summers. Here. Taylor. Thorslin. Here. Vantage Therena. Here. Williams. Here. Wolken. Carter. Here. Cowart. Present. Esri. Here. Portado. Here. Patterson. Here. Uh, next on the agenda, could I have a uh, motion for the approval of the agenda and agenda? So move forward. Uh, move by Second, Colbert. Michaels. Michaels. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, same sign. All right, next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the March 15th, 2022 20, regular meeting. So um, moved, Harper. Second, Harper. Uh, Any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, same sign. Next on the agenda is public comment. Um, first, we have Lynn Canfield. I was hoping I could go second. What do you think? <laughs> uh, uh, chair's discretion will allow it. Oh, yeah. Um, Uh, I have, uh, sorry, uh, Kim, uh, Boldwee Fisher. Do I press the, is uh, no, it on? You, it's is already on? on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, members of the Champaign County Board. My name is Kim Fisher, and I'm a resident of the Champaign County, of, of Champaign County, and a member of the Champaign County Developmental Disabilities Board. So I just want to express uh, my support for the use of the American uh, Rescue Plan Act relief monies for premium pay for direct support professionals, which would support Champaign residents with developmental disabilities. In your packets tonight, our board has, and uh, Ms. Canfield have included information on the important work direct support professionals provide to individuals with developmental disabilities. These workers help Champaign residents with uh, developmental disabilities with activities of daily living, advocacy work, employment, transportation, le leisure activities like participating in park district programs or even shopping. These workers have worked throughout the pandemic and are considered essential workers. They have put their lives at risk to do this important work throughout the pandemic. The final rule for the American Rescue Plan Act spending provisions was released on January 27, 2022. In that document, the final rule confirms in place the interim regulations for premium pay for essential workers, in particular using funds to provide worker retention incentives. Specifically, the regulations state, quote, funds may be used to provide worker retention incentives, which are designed to persuade employees to remain with the employer as compared to other employment options, end quote. During the health, public health emergency, employers' policies on COVID-19 related premium pay or hazard pay have varied widely with many essential workers not yet compensated for the heightened risks they have faced and continue to face. Many of these workers earn lower wages on average and live in socioeconomically underserved communities and support people who live in underserved communities as compared to the general population. There are no options for service, social service agencies nor the Developmental Disabilities Board to provide funding for premium pay for these essential workers. The state of Illinois has indicated that they will not be using these funds for this work and with the turnover rate and retention issues and the direct support professional services throughout the pandemic, residents of Champaign County are at real great risk for social and community isolation because they do not have the support to live, learn, work, and play in the community. By providing a system for retention funds for direct support professionals, we can use ARPA funds to stabilize some of these employment for uh, DSPs and those they serve. The state has a 27% vacancy rate for DSPs, and this prevents many people with DD from living and participating in their community. We, we respectively, we, excuse me, we respectively, um, respectfully ask the county board to engage in conversation for using these funds for this purpose as DSPs continue to put themselves at risk 
during the pandemic and to support individuals with DD in Champaign County. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Glenn Canfield. So thank you, Dr. Fisher, for doing that. She got the facts. It was really helpful. I did not write any notes. I'm, I feel like you all are a television show that I've been watching for two years, and now I'm a, su a special surprise guest. So it's really weird. But um, I'm Lynn Canfield. I'm the executive director of the Developmental Disabilities Board and the Mental Health Board, and I'm a resident of Champaign County. I'm also a person with a lifelong interest in developmental disabilities and services. And so this issue is with me all the time. Um, like many of you, I've spent the last few days reading summaries of the budget, the state budget. Um, it's There are some really important bits of good news in there, but not what we needed to solve this DSP workforce crisis. And it's a, it's a crisis on the national level too. The big hope earlier in the year that there would be legislation allowing an appropriation which could right-size this problem permanently disappeared about four months ago, and it has never come back. So, so there's no relief coming from the federal level. And now with the, the announced budget, we know there's no relief coming from the state level either. There are certain things the DD Board and the Mental Health Board can do to help with this, but I've got attorneys who've looked at our statutes over and over again, and to my disappointment, they tell me, you can't do this. So this one thing that you can do with ARPA funding, which would be really more of a gesture than anything else, it doesn't right-size the problem, but it communicates to people who do this work that this work matters to somebody, um, and I think that would be a really big deal. I made a specific request last year, but it was very early in your process. It was before you had a process, and we don't have a specific request right now because we've been waiting to see how these other things would pan out. So. You know, it's very disappointing now that the state is not putting money into this. Um, one good thing that happened is I've all along wondered if, you know, maybe the problems are foundational and the money doesn't come because the work is not understood. So for the first time ever, um, NACO adopted a policy resolution to communicate to the federal government, and I wrote it, and it, it stands up for people with um, who work in direct support professional positions and asks for them to have a unique classification in the Bureau of Labor S Statistics. That will allow us to really describe the job for the first time ever because it's lumped in with 10 other jobs that it's not really like. So we may have an opportunity to build the case for paying people better once we can show that the competencies required to do this work are, you know, many, many more than similar jobs um, and sort of backfill into that. But by that time, we won't have a community-based system left. We're losing services all over the state, actually all over the country, but in Illinois, we have a, a deeper problem that started earlier, so we've lost a lot of service capacity already. It continues to disappear. The state has, in its budget, a promise of giving more funding awards to people with developmental disabilities, but it doesn't matter if there's no one who will provide the services. And that's the position that we're in right now. So it's kind of like at Christmas, if I give you gift cards to a store that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I read, the, I read it that way, and I think some other advocates see it that way too. So anyway, I'm sorry for rambling. I just wanted to give you that context. This is kind of personal for me, and I realize with no specific request for you to consider, we don't really have to go anywhere with this, but I wanted you to understand these issues and also to know that I'm trying to apply some due diligence before asking you for anything. So anyway, that's about it. Thanks, Lynn. Next is uh, Jennifer Henry. Uh, if you push the button in the middle. This one. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Thank you. Thank 
Uh, something happened. It's red? Oh, when it's red, it's good. Okay, we'll try this again. I'm Jennifer Henry. I am new to Champaign. I have been here about eight months. I'm the executive director for Promise Healthcare. Um, it's often referred to as Francis Nelson, and that's generally how the community is familiar. We've been around for decades, and we are a federally qualified health center. One thing that is really unique about a federally qualified health center is we do not turn away, turn away any patient regardless of whether they can pay for services or not. So we always do more with less, but less is where we currently are. And so you have information in your packet tonight to help us to continue to support our psychiatric services and mental health services and behavioral health. Um, it is more than just psychiatry, but it's also all of the enabling services that we provide. Um, when patients come in, they have, um, they're generally uninsured self-pay. Um, sometimes they have been incarcerated and they have just faced a lot of barriers to care. And we do all that we can. It's not just the services, but it's transportation, housing, employment, anything that we can. Um, it is a program that's expensive, but it's really needed. I've been with community health centers 17 years and have never had full-time psychiatric services, let alone two and a half psychiatrists. So we're really fortunate, but it is an expensive program. And so our intent was to um, see if some of the ARPA funds could be used to help us fund for the next year, and that's um, in the packet um, for your consideration. So I appreciate that very much. Now do I press off? All right, thank you. Next is uh, Jim Hamilton. I think I got it figured out. You can hear me? Well, um, I didn't hear the name back there. I can't hear too clearly, but I'm here on the behalf of Promise Healthcare as well. My name is Jim Hamilton. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health for Promise Healthcare. I'm also a provider with Promise Healthcare. I did hear Jennifer give you a little of the background information on uh, Francis Nelson and what an important asset um, it is in this community and how important it's been to the community dating back into the, um, the 60s. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the services that we provide. Um, we're an integrated health care center. We provide medical, behavioral health, dental services. We also have uh, community navigators to go out and out do outreach into the community to help link uh, people in Champaign County and surrounding areas with uh, resources. We provide adult wellness and case management at Promise Healthcare, uh, where we help link people to um, food sources if they're without food or um, help with their utility bills or housing and help them plug, plug them into the right agencies locally to help those things happen. Uh, we also provide mental health counseling for um, a wide variety of clients um, and psychiatric care for adults. And we provide uh, mental health counseling for children too. Um, we have the Francis Nelson site on Bloomington Road. We also have a site at Promise on Walnut um, most people might be familiar that Rosecrans is uh, housed in that building, but we also have a presence there as well. We also um, have a site at the Urbana Schools in the Urbana School Based Clinic. We provide medical, dental, and mental health counseling there. We serve about, um, the psychiatrists serve probably between um, 2,000 and 2,500 patients a year, and the mental health counseling probably serves between six, you know, between 800 to maybe 1,200 patients a year. It just kind of depends on, on uh, you know, how the frequency and everything. Um, I think it's a really important funding. Um, I think that it will have um, a very important impact on the community. We're integrated health, and we believe that everything's connected. And so if we're in a position where we're not providing the level of services that we have in the past, I think you're going to see greater pressure on food banks, greater pressure on the emergency departments at OSF and CARL uh, from psych patients going there looking to get medications filled during crisis. Um, and I think also you'd see higher impacts on law enforcement locally um, if people aren't getting adequate mental health services. Uh, so I, I hope you give this your due consideration and we appreciate the time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next we have uh, Shea Wood, a word. I tried to pay attention to that the whole time. I know. Um, uh, thank you. My name is Shay Ward. I'm uh, with Promise Healthcare, the director of marketing. Um, I really didn't have much more to, to add. Um, we uh, I misunderstood the rules, which is why they don't usually bring me to these things. So I thought we were present together. But I just want to mention I've been here for about two years, and I moved from community in a state that didn't have this kind of collaboration. It was one of the first things I was amazed by when I moved to Champaign County. Is the the way all the organizations work together and the support of the boards and funding. So I just wanted to share that observation and we're really proud to be a part of all this collaboration and serving the needs of some of the most at-risk uh, folks in our county. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who would uh, like to participate in public participation? All right, um, next on the agenda we have, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Hi, my name is Rebecca Obachowski, um, and I am the Executive Director of Community Choices. Um, we are a human services cooperative in Champaign, that serves Champaign County, um, uh, serves people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities as well as their families. Um, in my position, I have sort of the unique ability to, to speak to a lot of families. Um, we, we work with over 100 families every year, and over the last two years, we've, um, we've continued to hear to a much greater extent how deeply the staffing crisis in this field is beginning to affect them at every level. Um, <clears throat> they're not able to access the services they need. They're not ac able to um, make move forward on the plans and goals that they have. Um, I'm also part of a statewide work group looking at strategies to, ad to address the staffing crisis um, all over the state because providers all over the state are experiencing the same problem. Um, and they are struggling. And the providers here in this community are struggling also. Um, and I believe that our community has a great opportunity to use these funds to support this workforce that's doing absolutely vital work um, and has been working extraordinarily hard um, at, on, on things that couldn't stop during the pandemic. So I hope you'll consider this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to contribute? All right. Um, next to the agenda under communications, we have... Um, a memo on premium pay for direct support professionals uh, uh, in developmental disability service settings. Um, that was written by um, Lynn Canfield, um, the CDB board uh, executive director. Um, does anybody have any comments on that? There's also a, a memo from uh, Promise Healthcare, uh, kind of summarizes uh, what they had discussed earlier as well. Um, next up is the finance agenda. Oh, Jim, did you, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask when this might be brought to the board and uh, where they ex um, we expect the money, would, what slot or tranche of money this type of funding might come out of if um, we, we decide to fund it. Mm -hmm. Those are definitely things we need to figure out and you know, those kind of knowledge that there's, there's not a direct ask. I think the point of this was more just to acknowledge the problem. Um, all right, uh, finance agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just not doing good tonight. Uh, I don't know if this is the time. Uh, the Promise Healthcare request, what is their major uh, source of revenue? What's, what's their funding mechanism? Does anybody know? Um, yeah, I think she can. If there's somebody that knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our major funder, we receive um, a federal grant from the um, federal government, HRSA, that allows us to offer a sliding fee scale, and generally that's all that that covers, so that anybody who comes in who doesn't qualify for insurance or other programs, that um, they can qualify based on income independence. So that's our largest one. We do bill for services, so insurance plans we also do when we can, but most of our patients are either Medicaid or Medicare, and then uninsured and self-pay. And then we have other funders as well, Champaign County Mental Health. Yeah. I'd just like to uh, go ahead and thank all the people who wrote in to us, um, shared their personal stories and their struggles regarding um, their relatives and loved ones with 
developmental disabilities. Um, we've all definitely uh, read them uh, with the care that they deserve. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Anybody have any general board communications? All right. Um, finance agenda, Stephanie. Um, sure. Budget amendment BUA 2022388 fund 1080 general corporate department 040 sheriff increased appropriations 38,400 increased revenue 38,400 reason insurance reimbursement for damaged squad car. Mr. So Esri? moved. Esri? So moved. Okay. Second. Oh, yeah. McGuire. Okay. Esri first. McGuire second. Um, I would point out, I think the sheriff is here. He is, if anybody has any questions. Any questions? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Budget Amendment BUA 2022 3 3389 Fund 2075 Regional Planning Commission Department 100. Regional Planning Commission increased appropriations 50,000, increased revenue 50,000. Reason appropriation to develop an allocation plan for the Urbana Home Consortium's Home Investment Partnerships American Rescue Plan Program Home ARP funding. Um, do I have a motion? Mary, do I have a second? Ms. Sorry. Eric, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Budget Amendment BUA 2022-3450 Fund 2075 Regional Planning Commission Department 100 Regional Planning Commission Increased Appropriations 263,000 Increased Revenue 263,000 Reason Receipt of ARPA funds for distribution to eligible households that were negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Do I have a motion? Mike Bowles? Second. Carter? Discussion? I, I would just like to thank Lisa Benson who put this proposal together and this will zero out once this is expended that category of money that we put into mortgage slash water slash that assistance money. So this is what's left over after we did the sewer assistance uh, last month. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Budget amendment. Um, if it's okay with everyone, these next two are related. They are just projects that didn't get done in fiscal year 2021. Is it okay if I take these together? Okay. Budget Amendment BUA 2022-3457, Fund 3105, Capital Asset Replacement Fund, Department 059, Facilities and Planning, Increased Appropriations $2,510,591, Increase revenue zero dollars. Reason budget amendment to reencumber funds for fiscal year 2021 facilities projects ongoing in fiscal year 2022. And budget amendment BUA 2022 3551 fund 2083 County Highway Department 062 Highway Building Capital. Increased appropriations $274,150.50. Increased revenue zero. Reason budget amendment to reencumber funds for fiscal year 2021 facilities projects ongoing in fiscal year 2022. So moved. Eric. Second, Harper. I got, I, sorry, I had Eric and Harper. Sorry, I saw him first. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, the auditor's report is on the website. The um, next up is the sheriff. Resolution authorizing an agreement with advanced correctional health care for inmate medical and mental health services in Champaign County, Illinois, pursuant to RFP 2022-001. Uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Patterson? Ms. Second. Motion. Second. Um, again, the sheriff is here. Mr. McGuire, D Dustin and... Diane, sure, or, yeah, if you could come up. We'll go Jim and then Diane. Diane, are you going to answer my question? Uh, yeah. Happy to. Thanks. Just a couple of quick questions. On page 30 of our packet, 
Um, you gave us the bids that were on here. Um, Advance is almost 300,000 more than the correctional group um, because Promise Healthcare said that they did not believe they currently had the infrastructure in place to be successful in the contract, which made me wonder why they bid in the first place. And then we also have money being asked for, so it was just a little confusing. I'm assuming you're talking about my memo, correct? Okay. <clears throat> so we were actually really excited with Promise Healthcare um, coming in, but we, the, the top three we called in for oral uh, presentations, kind of a conversation. And afterwards, they realized that I think the liability that goes on a healthcare provider in the jail, um, the logistics, all of the operations, I mean, you know, it's, it's not just putting a nurse in there and then simply, you know, going home at the end of the day, there's a lot that goes into it. And after that conversation, um, I think we mutually agreed that hopefully in a couple of years, they'll come back to us and they'll be able to, uh, to provide us some quality healthcare. But at this point, they wouldn't be able to hit the ground running based on what they had. I just wondered if there was a correlation between their communications and your bid. Not that I'm aware of. And then the other was, of course, the advanced correctional health care, which is the one that you're asking us to accept tonight, is almost 300,000 different. So I wanted to know what made them tip the scale, even though they were 300,000 more or 280,000, whatever it is. Sure. <clears throat> so. Overall, um, you know, you can see those who participated in uh, the process here. This affects JDC and the, and the uh, adult jails, and so we were all involved in the conversation and things like that. The thing that really uh, stuck out to us with advanced correctional health care is, based on the information that we had at our hands, they are a lot more established than what the two lower bidders were. Um, it, our, our impression uh, on, one, on one part, our impression was is that they can come in, hit the ground running, and they have all the policies and procedures and everything they need to be successful in the jail. The other thing is, and you know, we currently have WellPath, their price went up significantly, their price quote from what we're currently paying. Um, we have not had good luck lately with WellPath with um, getting mental health coverage and even some nursing coverage that they are contractually able to provide. And they are, uh, you know, they are stating that it's, uh, you know, employment issues and things like that, which I can surely understand. However, the advantage to advanced correctional health care is that, it, it, and not an advantage over WellPath, but an advantage over the other two, would be that they serve a lot of county jails in Illinois. And so if we are, for example, seeing an employment issue among nursing or mental health staff here, they may very well have somebody, let's say from Sangamon County, who's had them for 15 years. They may very well be able to pull somebody over for the day to cover that spot. Whereas the other two were relatively new, they didn't have as much of a structure in place. And, uh, and, it, and our impression was it would be a lot more difficult for them to be able to fill those holes, especially when we know that everybody is struggling for employees at this point. Mr. McGuire. Thank you. She did answer most of my questions. Thanks for the information and covering all those. Um, how are how is the health care of those that are being taken out of county being handled? Um, can you explain how, how that would work with these organizations? Sure. So the health care only covers who is in the satellite jail, downtown jail, and JDC. Kankakee, which is where all of our out of, except for one, uh, where all of our out of county boarding is, they have their own medical staff and they actually have a full time medical staff there. And whenever an inmate is in their custody, um, it falls under the, the correctional institution's health care at that point. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, other business, hopefully y'all are looking at the um, closed minutes. Uh, chair's report, or wait, do we have to vote on that? Oh, go for it. I move to follow the state's attorney's recommendation for all closed session minutes to remain closed. Second. Thank you. So Patterson and Esri, 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, for the chair's report, I don't really have anything except to say that we are, to, to Mr. McGuire's question about where would be the appropriate time to talk about those two, um, we don't have any money in the currently appropriated in the category for which that that would be allocatable from, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we couldn't do it. I mean, I do think for this year's sort of money, we are beginning to run up against it. But I, we did have two proposals, and this is like a preview, from ELUC that were more conversational that we are forwarding to the full board. Um, what we've been doing is um, having deeper conversations about ARPA funding at the full board meetings. And so maybe what we, we had two proposals from ELUC that didn't necessarily fit into the, the kind of funding that we had specifically appropriated. So we wanted to bring them to the full board for discussion about whether we should pursue them further. Um, either with money that we have left over from this year or carrying over into the next year's. So what maybe might make sense, and I guess this is for the executive, is could we also move those two to, to that conversation next week? Um, I think that all of those would be very much in the conversational stage. And at just some point, we as a body need to decide if we want to take them further to figure out, as Kyle said, where we could potentially fund them from. And you know, weighing all of these different things in conjunction with one another is an important thing. I also just wanted to say I, I just a great deal of appreciation um, for Chris Storr, who couldn't be here today, um, for Samantha Carter, who's been thinking a lot about the small business piece of it and has been putting a lot of energy into that, and then um, to Mr. Esri and to Eric, who've spent a lot of time on this, the, the water funding for ELUC, um, I thought, Eric did a, uh, Mr. Florizon did a fantastic job navigating a very complicated thing. Um, having money is its own problem, <laughs> right? Trying to figure out how to do it. So thank you, Eric, for shep trying to shepherd us through that conversation, and you all get the rest of it next Thursday. Um, so much things to put on the consent agenda are A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and C1 and D1. Oh, D1 doesn't have to go. Okay. I intended to vote no on A2, but you didn't ask for any opposed. You had intended to vote for it? But you didn't ask for any opposed. I did. You did not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Can I, all right. Opposed? Aye. All right. So, sorry. I apologize about that. All right. So, we will keep A2 off of consent. Keep A2 off of consent. And I apologize. I didn't realize I had not said no, no, no nays. Very sorry about that. All right. Um, next is uh, Justice and Social Services. Um, Ms. Taylor could not make it tonight, so uh, Ms. McGuire. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Obviously, first, we have the probation and court services and animal control reports, which will be placed on file. Then we have a presentation from Rosecrans uh, concerning our reentry program. If they would come up and make that presentation, please. Ms. D, who's, uh, who's, on bat, who's up to bat? Mr. Kelho. All right, well, uh, thanks for allowing us to come speak about this wonderful program. Uh, my name is Dave Keller Hall, Director of Mental Health Services at Rosecrans Central Illinois. Um, we have Misty Bell here, the, uh, please come over. Oh, sure. Uh, Dave Keller Hall is Director of uh, Mental Health Services here in Rosecrans Central Illinois. And then we have Misty Bell, our case manager of the program. So I'm going to start us off with a quick uh, introduction and summary, and then, and then Misty's going to take over. So. Um, so just to start with some quick statistics, um, according to uh, fairpunishment.org, nearly 700,000 prisoners are released annually. That's 1,800 daily, uh, and about 50%, uh, or one out of two prisoners reoffend or return to prison. Um, and the majority of these individuals uh, struggle with transitioning back into society due to many common factors, which we'll um, be talking about in the next slide here. Um, 
there are, of course, other entities and programs in Champaign County that, that can assist with some of these uh, aspects, but, but this program focuses on the holistic approach, um, trying to hit these seven main identifiers that uh, individuals coming out of prisons struggle with. Uh, they're in no particular order, but if you see the number one uh, listed there, it makes it difficult, well, almost impossible to do any of the other six. Um, and so this program uh, really wraps around these individuals to um, get them from that starting point to uh, walk them through the steps of, of maintaining um, some, some stability in society. Um, and then the, the program also facil facilitates the reentry council, uh, bringing all the interested reentry organizations, agencies to educate, establish, and implement systemic change within Champaign County to reduce the, reduce the recidivism. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide, what does the county board actually fund? Um, so a fully dedicated case manager that you see here in front of you um, and trained mental health professionals uh, that are um, accompanying him to, to assist him with these services. And so it's overseen by uh, the team lead, Karen Cohen-Heath, and then myself, the mental health director. Uh, and so the also comes with the ongoing formation, leadership, and organization of the reentry council. Um, data tracking, benchmarks, and outcome measures, of course, um, and then continue to, to research innovative ways to reach and connect with partners and individuals returning from incarceration. The next portion of our presentation um, will highlight some of the um, milestones that the reentry program as well as the reentry council um, have been able to successfully um, tackle as well as um, accomplish and identify over at least the last year and a half. Um, this Friday, I'll be submitting the first quarter report of this year. That report will highlight some of these things, but I wanted to give you guys a brief highlight um, of what we are currently doing at the moment. So as you guys know, there are some myths, um, some transitional myths as, and truths that exist when an individual is released from incarceration into the community. Uh, one of those is establishing their identity and obtaining some um, important documents, as um, Dave stated, to be successful in those other six areas. Um, a lot of that is trying to get IDs, trying to get birth certificates, trying to establish employment, education, and secure housing. Um, one of the things that we're able to do um, is address those things in, at the reentry council. We've been able to successfully partner uh, with IDOC, uh, one of the um, supervisors of the district currently, um, Angela uh, Makani, has been partnering with me and addressing some of these myths. So, for example, um, IDOC would normally allow an inmate to get receive an ID, an IDOC ID upon being released. As we know, that's not a valid government ID, and they're not able to get a lot of the documents that they need for employment, education, and or to secure housing. Um, and so um, Angela has been very instrumental in actually establishing a couple of pilot programs within the state to try to get inmates that are currently incarcerated those important documents prior to release. Currently right now what I'm doing is trying to mimic or at least tailor um, our um, process and procedure um, at the county jail, the local county, um, Champaign County Jail, to accomplish those same goals. Um, I get a lot of requests to come into the county jail um, for birth certificates, IDs, um, you know, um, social security cards, and it's very difficult um, if they don't have all the paperwork or the identifying um, documents they need to receive those IDs. Um, and so I'm hoping that once the pilot program is complete with um, IDOC, we can really bring that process locally um, into Champaign County and work with the county jail with Captain Bogus um, and getting those inmates those important documents they need prior to release. So that's a really good milestone that we've been able to accomplish um, over the last year. Um, also, um, just um, housing is, is the number one issue as it relates to reentry, specifically here within Champaign County as it relates to criminal background as well as um, 
disparities um, amongst income source. As we know, there are ordinances in the city of Urbana that prohibits that, um, but um, those ordinances um, does not necessarily exist in the city of Champaign. So we have been able to successfully collaborate currently right now with the city of Urbana with the new um, Office um, of Equality um, Officer um, and establish some processes when these discriminatory practices exist. Um, and we are in the process of um, partnering with the city of Champaign with bringing the new appointed um, position um, of um, Rachel Joy to the reentry table so that we can discuss these things moving forward. Um, the next thing is transportation. As we know, transportation is another huge barrier as it relates to reentry. Um, as you guys know, during the pandemic, the MTD offered free services for um, Champaign County to ride the, the public transportation free, but um, since then they have reinstated their fare. Um, and it's been very difficult for a lot of our clients to navigate to their necessary appointments and things like that. Um, I've been successful with the, this past quarter with um, connecting with the chief of staff at MTD, um, and she is. Um, willing and has accepted my invitation to come and sit on the reentry council so that we can work on this barrier moving forward. As you guys know, the MTD does offer a lot of resources within the community, but it's reduced resources. Um, and currently right now, I think amongst agencies, um, they provide half the cost of transportation, but transportation is still a huge barrier and it's still an expensive line item in the budget. Um, the next thing um, is the criminal justice um, system just responding to individuals um, that have been recently incarcerated with behavioral health challenges. Um, currently, right now, I have partnered with the parole office, the local parole office, that every inmate that is released is given my contact information, and they can contact me directly for immediately mental health and substance abuse screenings. Um, and that's very important, because based upon a lot of parolees stipulation, they have to get a mental health or substance abuse assessment very quickly. Um, and I'm able to at least screen them right away um, and help them navigate through the system of getting the necessarily behavioral health services they need um, quite efficient and efe efe effectively. The next thing is I did invite Senator Scott Bennett to our reentry council as of last year, and he discussed the criminal um, justice reform, um, which is um, the no um, bail, um, ballot and things like that coming down the pipeline, which will cause a lot of individuals to not be um, arrested um, that have mental health challenges with coming down the pipeline in the future. Um, and he was able to give us an insight on how this would affect a lot of reentry programs within the county. So currently right now what we're doing is revisiting a lot of that and then hopefully um, creating some type of recommendation or pilot program to him so that he can fight for legislative um, practices within Champaign County and also attach some dollar amounts to those so that we can kind of get some of those initiatives funded if um, the council agrees to those particular recommendations or pilot programs. Um, but at least we do have Senator Scott Bennett at the table and he's willing to partner with us. So I think that that's a huge um, impact. And then also, um, just as it relates to COVID-19, as you know, within the last year and a half, a lot of agencies within Champaign County um, has been um, providing services, but there may be limited services, or some have had to close their doors. Um, we've been very successful with adapting um, and providing innovative ways to continue to reach our clients, whether it's direct services and or linkage to other services um, via virtually and or telecommunication. Um, um, telecommunications. Um, so if I'm not able to meet them face to face because I'm concerned about health risk, at least I'm able to meet with them either over the phone or either via Zoom. And so we've still been able to provide um, at, at least a large portion of services even during the national pandemic that we've um, um, been facing lately. And then also we've continued to make progress as it relates to the reentry council um, because we continue to meet monthly virtually via Zoom and continue to make progress in the areas that we feel um, we need to focus on within Champaign County. The last highlight that I do want to bring up is just basically um, 
the connection as it relates to um, the compliance and confidentiality laws that have been affecting the release of inmates, um, not just within Champaign County, but statewide. So currently right now, the way the reentry program used to work is I would normally get a weekly release of all inmates that parolees that would be released into Champaign County, and I was able to make contact with them um, and meet with them and do screenings with them. Um, that has not been in place for at least the last two years. Um, and so with the help of, you know, um, Angela McConney, which is the district supervisor, as well as partnering with, you know, the new um, chain of command at the parole office, we've able to at least hire interns and establish some type of release of information um, prior to individuals being released so that they um, can contact me prior or allow me to contact them uh, with their information prior to being released once they're released. So these are some highlights that I just wanted to share with you guys um, that we've made progress within the last year and a half during the national pandemic that I wanted to let you guys make you guys aware of. The last thing is I just wanted to give you guys some trends just over the last four years. Um, as you guys know, um, you guys have started funding the reentry program in 2014. Um, and at that particular time, the data that I was able to retrieve was that we were sitting at a 41% um, countywide as it relates to recidivism. Currently right now, even during the national pandemic, our numbers either stayed steady or kind of increased as it relates to service plans and also successful and partial um, um, cases as it relates to individuals that successfully met their service plans. Um, and then one of the things I did wanted to highlight particularly was the recidivism. I can't um, calculate the non-engagement because I don't get those individuals anymore, the weekly releases anymore. Um, because I would basically calculate recidivism as it relates to engaged as well as non-engaged to compare them. Um, before that um, did cease, um, they were running very closely um, and they were running between like a 20, 25% uh, recidivism rate as it relates to both of them. But what I wanted to highlight as it relates to the engaged recidivism rates, but in 2018, we were at 5%. It kind of increased a little bit just because of COVID and things like that. It went to 13% um, and it's gradually going down from 2020 to 2021 from 12 to 10%. And we're currently right now sitting at 10%. The last one, I just wanted to highlight those trends to you so that you can see kind of the data as it relates to the last four years as we've went through this COVID-19. And that concludes our presentation. Sorry, Samantha, you have some questions. I just wanted to see the numbers of the first slide. I got down. Um, <clears throat> The very first slide. I just wanted to write those numbers down. Um, currently, right now, the statistic that exists is there's about seven. There's nearly about seven hundred thousand prisoners that are released annually right now, um, and currently, right now, the national recidivism rate sits at about fifty percent, which means that one out of two individuals that are released reoffend. I guess I just didn't realize that the numbers were so high. Yeah. I mean, every other uh, released prisoner has the ability of maybe reoffending if they're not given those those needful resources, you mm -hmm. know. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And also thank you for the, the work that you do in our community. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bell, I know you personally have known you for years. I appreciate your uh, the hard work that you do in this community. I've also recently had two nephews that went through Rosecrans that had some help on changing their life around and making better choices. So I do appreciate the hard work that you guys do for this community. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Williams. Are you first, Jane? Go ahead. Thank you for all this information. And I know you don't have current numbers because you're not receiving the, the full list of 
uh, parolees to contact, but is there information from 2014 or earlier on the percentage of people you do make contact with who, who do have reentry plans with you? Yes, so the um, quarterly report that I will submit this Friday has all the um, comprehensive data since 2014. So you can, you can um, compare and contrast from 2014 to the current year that we're in now. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, at what point do you engage people to help them get their vital documents, like the birth certificate and ID? Are they still incarcerated, or is it after they come out? So currently, right now, it's twofold. I'm sorry, Wayne, I couldn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Um, I asked, uh, at what point um, do they engage uh, people uh, to get their vital documents, the birth certificate and ID and Social Security card? Is it while they're incarcerated, or is it after they come out? So it's twofold. Traditionally, we have worked with individuals um, at the point of reentry, which means at the point of being released. Um, when Cab Captain Vogus, uh, which is um, one of the captains that sit um, at the county jail, was um, our co-facilitator of the reentry council, we noticed that the percentage um, um, of to reoffend um, lowered if we engaged with them prior to being released. Um, and so one of the things that I implemented a couple of years ago um, was um, partnering with the county jail to receive a sentencing report. Um, we just recently re um, instated that because of COVID-19. They weren't able to provide a lot of that information to us. But we just recently, within the past month, reinstated that. So I will go at least to the county jail to um, engage with those individuals prior to being released because the percentage of them being lost in the system or not being able to make contact, um, the, the, the percentage gets greater once they're out because they may not be residing where mm -hmm. it's documented that they're supposed to reside. So, I, I um, want you to talk about uh, a little bit more about the importance. I mean, I keep my ID and driver's license on me everywhere I go, but I can't tell you the last time I actually needed it for something, right? So can you talk about why it's so important, um, the work you do, like what uh, obstacles might someone face after they are uh, released and not have an ID? Most. <laughs> uh, most definitely. Um, that's a very important, um, um, uh, to me, aspect as it relates to reentry because that will determine their success moving forward. Um, as you know, if you don't have those viable documents, you cannot gain an employment, you cannot secure housing, you cannot um, enroll into um, an accredited institution, a, a lot of that. So I've created a, 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 a workflow as it relates to getting those important documents um, I did not, I was not aware of this because as a normal citizen, we don't realize mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, how blessed or how fortunately, how fortunate we are to have access to our documents. Um, and so when a prisoner is released, the first thing that I do try to establish is to get them an ID card. Before you can get an ID card at the DMV, which is the Secretary of State, you have to have three major documents. Those three major documents is your birth certificate, your social security card, and proof of residency. You can substitute all of those, like your passport and other information, but they have to be valid government IDs, and a lot of them do not have any of that. The only thing that they may have upon being released is their parole letter from the sheriff stating where they will reside as it relates to their parole address. That serves as their proof of residency. In order to get a Social Security card, the Social Security Administration requires that you prove your identity. In order to prove your <laughs> identity, <laughs> I have to take inmates, oh, I'm sorry, recently returning citizens into the community to some local medical facility where they have been seen to get an immunization record. That immunization record has to be sealed and stamped by that institution. If it is open, it is invalid, and it will not 
the Social Security Office will not accept it. We have to get that to the Social Security Office in addition to their application, and then they will honor giving them a replacement Social Security card. Of Champaign County, because working with the, 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 um, um, the county, they provide free birth certificates to any individual that have been born in Champaign County 30 days upon being released. So if they are from Champaign County, it makes my job very easy. But if they are not from Champaign County, it is very difficult trying to get virtual records from Cook County and any other county outside of Champaign County. So, so I'm, I'm asking these questions because I, I think you're doing God's work. And um, I think it's very easy to forget um, how difficult it is to get that first identity document. I recently had to get a passport um, while at the same time moving, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of had to start over, but I had all the privilege of my income status, knowing where you know, my residence is, and being able to prove it. And uh, I can imagine that you face some unique difficulties um, when um, trying to help people with that. And I think you kind of downplayed the work you did, and that's why I asked you mm -hmm. these questions. Um, and uh, it's very important work that you do, and I want to thank you for doing it. And one other thing that I would like to highlight is that when an individual is released, it is very important that they do link, and I try to connect them to the reentry program um, very fast because a lot of individuals will try to attack the, attack, you know, accomplish these tasks independently, and they get frustrated. And when they mm -hmm. become frustrated, they go back out into the community and they reoffend because they feel like they cannot successfully succeed because they're constantly jumping through hoops and going, ch it's almost like chasing their tail in a circle. Um, and so I, I definitely understand, and that's why I try to get them linked to the reentry program as soon as they're released. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Quite a few. If not, um, one of the other things that we see, um, Misty, you might be able to explain a little bit, is the ID um, and being able to get um, Medicaid, Medicare, which is something that healthcare consumers helps in the jail, um, and why that's important for mental health reasons. Can you explain that, please? Yes, so individuals, um, particularly um, that are in IDOC, do get um, medical insurance, but they have 30 days once they're released to basically um, re-enroll. Um, a lot of them are released with psychotropic medication that they've been put on um, from the psychiatrist, um, and a lot of them aren't able to successfully fulfill those prescriptions once they're released. Um, then they'll have a, you know, a, either a psychotic episode or a crisis or anything could possibly happen. Healthcare Consumers is an agency that we partner with, and Claudia Linhoff has been very, very helpful as it relates um, to linkage um, and helping individuals with fulfilling those prescriptions once they're released if they can't uh, fulfill them themselves and get connected to a doctor immediately upon release. So a lot of times when individuals are released and they are on some type of psychotropic medication and after I do their mental health and substance abuse screening and I see that they need that medication um, immediately because they're only given 30 days of medication once they're released or a prescription for 30 days, um, I have to get them into an evaluation very quickly and fast so that they can see a psychiatrist to either get that medication adjusted or field. Um, but healthcare consumers has been very, very helpful with stepping into the gap and assisting and getting those um, prescriptions filled. Um, and also, they've been very helpful um, because individuals aren't aware that they do have to re-enroll for their medical insurance once they're released, and a lot of them don't know that. Um, and they've been very helpful as well as IDOC with the supervisor, the district supervisor, with being able to connect with that information prior to them being released or once they're released, could get that information immediately. They can look it up into a database and be able to re-enroll them um, really successfully and efficiently. Um, as you've t go ahead. Do you have a question? Yes. So, what's the ideal duration of contact in perpetuity, or do you sort of have a year um, 
I mean, how long do you try to maintain contact with someone that's been reentered in? Well, I would say on an average, um, it would be between two to three months, but it's really depending on their service plan. Every service plan is uniquely tailored to that individual. Um, like I said, they, um, like Dave reiterated, um, and we're highlighting, there's numerous of reentry programs in Champaign County, a lot. <laughs> but we focus on it holistically. And so when an individual comes to Rosecrans, they identify what they feel they need to be successful in the community. Uh, we just don't specialize in housing. We don't just specialize in you know um, employment or education. We specialize in all of them. And if we can't provide that direct service to them, we provide a linkage to an appropriate agency that can help them. Um, but on an average, it's between two to three months. Um, depending on their service plan and how it's tailored to them, it could take longer. OK, thank you. Um, Earlier, sorry, I'm asking these questions. I have a reason for it. Um, earlier, you talked about the change in bail laws. And at our last meeting, we discussed the issue that I think you t touched on, that we have to have some types of services, which I think in this county we've tried to do for years, of um, diverting people from the jail in the first place, that the, the um, laws will change that trespassing uh, will be something that's really kind of a ticket. Um, of course, that person who has a mental illness may not realize they can't go back to where they were, but eventually we have to have some kind of support for them so that they, they don't end up in jail. Um, there's, there was a discussion earlier by um, Promise Healthcare about two more people doing th th that kind of work. Uh, David, do you think that we have the capacity to try to work on something like this and how we would put it together? Currently, no. I mean, I think we're all, we're all struggling with um, keeping, retaining staff. However, um, I do think that will change. And I think from where Rosecrans was even just a year ago, which is the only reference I can really use other than uh, word of mouth, I think we've made some, some strides in that direction. Um, and I think um, if we continue in that direction, we, we could have the capacity to to get closer to that to that goal. Okay. Um, the only other, you know, because we're going to talk about, we're going to start our community violence intervention discussion here in a little bit. The only other service that we have is the Youth Assessment Center, which is kind of pre-problem. Um, both you and them uh, probably need more support. Um, and that... Um, um, it, it's an opportunity to have wraparound services, and that's really what you do for reentry and the Youth Assessment Center. You think the organizations are ready to try to, I mean, you just talked about the shortage of staff, but somehow we work or have an idea of what the cost of that might be or how we might move forward to try to have that kind of impact on families before they have an issue or those returning. I don't know if you want to try to comment on that or you see a question in that. Uh, with the Youth Assessment Center, do you mean in, in terms of um, providing these with for the, the juvenile population? Yeah, I mean, obviously the schools have issues, the communities have issues, the families have wraparound services. Maybe I'm making more of a comment that um, um, if, if we're going to provide money for um, violence intervention, that we have programs that are trying to work to do that locally. Yeah, I think, uh, and not just speaking for Rosecrans, but I, I do think um, from the youth standpoint, there's not as much, not as many services that are available for adults, unfortunately. Um, that is something that we, um, Rosecrans has a goal of, of uh, improving, um, again, with the staffing um, patterns allowing for it. but. Um, I do agree. I think in order for uh, programs like reentry and other other services out there, we um, we don't have the things in place to support them to follow up with these individuals after um, the the incident or 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 their family member being released. Then um, we're 
kind of, <laughs> I don't know what the, what the analogy would be, but we're not putting, um, uh, we're just kind of putting a Band-Aid on it that's not going to stay on there. But um, so I, I, I agree, and I think um, that is uh, a goal that we um, would like to, to see improve with, with staffing and availability um, and funding improving, of course. Any other questions? Thank you both for your presentations and the work that you're doing. Um, the only thing I see is chair's report. I don't, oh, sorry. I'll do a motion to, uh, I move to follow the state's attorney's recommendation uh, for all closed session minutes to remain closed. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, is that it? I have no chair's report. I think we had a good report this evening. Uh, the only item would be on consent is the semi closed. Yeah, technically not. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Jim. All right, next up is policy personnel and appointments, and we have a pattern of chairs not being able to make it tonight. So, Mr. Pasolacqua. Thank you very much. I'll do my best to fill in for Chris, who you know he would love to be here if he could. Um, County Executive Report is in the packet and online. She is right behind me if anyone has any questions for her. Um, I would like to present as an omnibus and read A through O as they are all uh, fire protection district appointments unless there's any objection to that. Uh, resolution appointing Todd Jameson to Pasodum Fire District term ending 4-30-2023. A resolution appointing Alan Holt to Pasodum Fire District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Clifford Gorman to the Philo Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Roger Hayden to the Tolono Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Frederick Seabold to the Sodoris Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Chris Ehler to the Thomasboro Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Roger Ponton to the Sangamon Valley Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Kenny During to the Ludlow Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Jeff White to the Ivesdale Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Todd Courtney to the Windsor Park Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Clayton Coulter to the Broadlands Longview Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Bernie Magsman to the Scott Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Norman Paul to the St. Joseph Stanton Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Resolution appointing Mark McDuffie to the Scott Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. And resolution appointing Patricia Chancellor to the Eastern Fire Prairie, Eastern Prairie Fire Protection District term ending 4-30-2025. Do I have a motion for A through O? So I move Michaels, second Harper. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Seeing none. Item P. Resolution appointing Mark Douglas to Silver Creek Drainage District, unexpired term ending 8-31-2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved Harper. Second, Esri. All in favor? Aye. Aye. As opposed? Seeing none. As my friend Chris Dore always does, I'd like to stress we have lots of current vacant appointments. Full list available at the website as noted. And there is also applications for open appointments provided. Um, 
a monthly report from the county clerk. And I believe the clerk has a presentation regarding the ARPA projects. I'm sorry. We'll give a moment. Not available. It was. Well, let's um, pause there and move on to the county executive. Section C, request for job evaluation content committee review of a new senior systems administrator position. I see MC Neal is behind me. Would you like to speak to that? I uh, thought I was just here to answer questions. Uh, good evening, board. I think I pretty much outlined everything. I am coming in very hot. Uh, I think I outlined everything in the memo. <clears throat> Biggest thing with this position is we have a growing need for a staff member in IT to be the uh, go-to for everything that is cybersecurity related. Uh, cybersecurity is, or cybercrime, should I say, is big business. Uh, it continues to grow. I think uh, this past year, over $7 billion was uh, taken from multiple organizations is estimated to grow up to 10 billion. So uh, criminals try to um, uh, use uh, extortion. They, they try to steal personal identification information. Uh, and because of that, they try to find any vulnerabilities in different products, services, things of that nature. And so right now, the IT department, on a regular basis, we're getting communications from our uh, security companies from uh, the vendors of different applications and services that we run here in the county saying the vulnerability was found we need you to uh, scan your network to see if you're running this version if you are you need to patch it uh, there's logs that need to be scanned and um, ultimately we just need some extra manpower to make sure we're doing everything that we need to do to keep the, the county secure so that's going to be the bulk of what this position does. Um, some of the other things is um, just being able to help us with our ever-growing list of special projects, um, being able to serve in a backup capacity of uh, some uh, areas that we have subject matter experts in right now when they're out of the office, when they are uh, sick, out on vacation, uh, giving us uh, some additional coverage for our 24-7 units. The hope would be to have this person work uh, Sunday through Thursday shift or a Tuesday through Saturday shift to give us at least one weekend day. Uh, right now, IT, uh, we are providing coverage Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. With the recent hire, we now have work in evenings. So uh, again, the aim is with this new hire to get a uh, at least one weekend day in with that as well. And um, Overall, just to provide us some additional coverage, another thing I mentioned is when we are all in the office, we are able to uh, keep up for the most part, but when any of us are out sick, out at a conference, things of that nature, we, we kind of start falling behind. And with IT uh, staff earning comp time instead of getting paid overtime, when I have uh, some staff working extra hours to keep up on the uh, folks who are out of the office, those people then very quickly hit their cap for comp time. So then they want to take time off to go through that. And then uh, the, the cycle kind of starts over. So uh, again, this hire will be able to address all of those points and um, a, a couple others I, I didn't specifically mention. Uh, I, I did just want to uh, make note of two things. One, uh, something that was in the memo, uh, Tammy told me to make sure uh, to, to clearly state that this would be a new position in the organizational chart and funding would be needed if the position was approved. Uh, and secondly, I know that I was here, I believe, end of last summer um, for a request. I just wanted to clarify that that request was not adding a new staff member to the org chart. That was simply changing a vacant desktop support position to a application support specialist position uh, a, a technology trainer, if you will. Um, they were in the same pay grade. It was already a, a position. It was just one that was vacant that um, I, I was trying to change for 
uh, th this specific use case, but uh, this is the, uh, I spoke with Bill Colebrook and found out this is the first new position that IT has requested, uh, I believe, um, since 2013 or 2014. Um, so it, it has been a while and uh, hopefully you can imagine all the additional technology and services and, and products that the county has implemented since then. And so um, we're, we're just at the point where we, we need some additional manpower to keep things afloat. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Kyle? I just want to say that uh, you know, I'm really supportive of this idea. Um, I mean, we talk a lot about our facilities deficit, but I think that um, you know, it might be that our biggest deficit as a county is our technology, and you know, we're taking on a lot of uh, projects and changes, and it, it seems apparent that you know, your department could definitely benefit, and the whole county could benefit from this. Um, and while we're on topic of uh, cybersecurity, if you all ever get a really vague email from me, double check the email address to make sure it's not random letters and numbers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I also get those emails from me, my email account. Um, but just as a forewarning. <laughs> you mean the one that says, can you contact me discreetly? <laughs> yeah, so yes, use all like language like. <laughs> okay, uh, um, C2 workforce study update is, is in progress. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um. <laughs> okay, I'd like a motion to Wayne has. Are all the other positions in IT field at the current moment? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, as of about two months ago, we are finally fully filled. Um, but for the first uh, 13 or 14 months I was here, uh, we always had at least one position vacant. So fingers crossed that it stays this way. Um, the, the IT space right now is extremely competitive. Uh, we One of our positions we lost because uh, a Another organization was paying 50% more than what we were paying our staff, so um, it, it's difficult to, to find folks, but we are uh, fully staffed a, as of now, um, and, and we... For this position, are you going to consider someone internal and then hire into that position, or do you know yet, or...? Um, more than likely, it would be uh, external, but I, I would uh, open it up. I, um, some staff that we currently have would be welcome to apply. And, and on that note, uh, with, with this position, um, with it being a, a new position, it's going to be positioned above our uh, system administrators. So uh, again, with that, that is something that some of our current system administrators would be able to, to apply for. But um, putting this position in place will give people a, um, a, a promotion ladder, if, if you will. Uh, right now, we have our um, help desk position, and then we have our systems administrators, and then um, not much left uh, above that. So uh, th this will be uh, an another opportunity for staff to um, hopefully decide to stay with the uh, with the organization and with the department, because uh, that that's another issue. When there are those staff members who do want to grow and get more experience, um, we we just don't currently don't have that extra position for them to be able to uh, be promoted to. Any more questions? Okay, I, I would entertain a motion to approve the request. Uh, King and Williams. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. And if we could jump back to B, uh, I believe Clerk Ammons is here to give us a presentation. Yeah, if you just push the button in the middle there. That's all right. I got you, Kyle. I got you. All right. I'm trying to, to work my little setup here. Make it work. All right, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for indulging me for a few moments. Um, I would like to do a quick uh, progress report um, based upon the, the funding that you all have uh, provided. 
for the clerk's office. So I really want to, to start this presentation by thanking you all for your support, for all, all of you who voted for the, the funding that we needed to get the, the new equipment so that I could modernize the office. So you may recall that I came before the board seeking approximately $700,000 to modernize our elections in Champaign County. The board agreed that the clerk's office would receive roughly $480,000 to start the process of purchasing new tabulators and replacing the ones that were no longer manufactured. We also agreed to another $250,000 in 2021 to purchase the new express vote machines that would replace the extremely outdated voter assistance terminals known as the Automark. We needed a new voter registration system to replace the proprietary system that only one person knew how to update and she didn't work for the county. We needed to replace the software and election management system that was running on Windows XP. While a good portion of the money uh, needed would eventually come from the general fund, we set out to find other funding sources and we were quite successful. Some of that success was due to the COVID-19 pandemic that forced the federal government to offer funding to address the changes in the election process. However, the growth of vote by mail was also a huge catalyst to us securing even more funding. So I am extremely proud to announce that we've brought in $1.4 million in grant funding to Champaign County to help ease the burden on taxpayers locally and decreasing the strain on the general fund. Um, you may, I don't know if some of you may have seen this or not, but there was an article in the News Gazette on May 28, 2019, entitled Funding Needed for Election Upgrades. So I wanted to come back to share what I've done with those funds and others to secure our elections and make voting even more efficient and accessible here in Champaign County. So in 2019, I would be happy if you would like to join me. Anyway, anyway, so in 2019, uh, we replaced the voter registration system um, that was pretty, it was unsafe and it was difficult for us to manage and that cost us $68,000. Uh, we bought 87 new ballot tabulators. So that's the tabulator that you see there, that is the DS200, which is the most modern piece of equipment for the election services. Uh, the organization or the, the vendor that we use. The older machines that we had was the M100 and they were no longer manufactured anymore when I took over. Uh, we bought 200 new laptops to serve as our electronic poll books. That cost $150,000 that we actually took from our, uh, our automated fund. The laptops that I inherited had not been updated for seven years and Windows 7 was no longer supported by Microsoft at that time. And then we also, in 2019, purchased a new security system in the, in the ESB building where the ballots are stored. When I took over office, the, we had a, a locked door basically to keep the, uh, the ballots safe, but we've upgraded that security system uh, since then. So uh, I don't know if there was something, there was just the laptops that we purchased. And then if you go again, please, Wayne. Uh, and then of course, now in 2020, we purchased the drop boxes and we were able to purchase, uh, to put them in seven different locations in Champaign-Urbana. That was a $20,000 expenditure that we received uh, grant money to, to pay for. Then the, the next thing is the Agilis Duo. Can you click that for me, please, Wayne? So, well, that's the OPEX opener machine right there. That is the, it was $78,000. And many people ask, you know, why do you need a machine to open envelopes? Well. Opening 30 envelopes with a letter opener might be fine, but 30,000 envelopes with a letter opener would be extremely difficult. Um, so the next piece is the Agilis Duo. I think you might have skipped one, Wayne. Oh, it's not in there. Okay, so go, go ahead. So the, that is the express vote. That is one of the, ultimately we ended up purchasing 11 the first round, and then we came back and bought more. But that first purchase was $35,000. The previous machines that we referred to as the Automark was also known as the 100-pound uh, pencil that was so outdated that the, some election judges refused to use them. So then we moved on to, if you move on, Wayne, the VBM security bags. Uh, that's not the best shot of one, but we have five of those uh, that we use when the election judges go out to pick up the ballots from the drop boxes. 
the, we upgraded the security inside the county clerk's office, and there's a duo. That's the Agilis duo that we purchased the first one. There was a small one that was $68,000. Uh, then we moved on to, as I said, we upgraded the security inside the county clerk's office to bring some uh, a level of security for folks inside and for the staff. Then we, uh, the organizational vote by mail items, there were many different things that we had to purchase in order to, to run the vote by mail process internally. And then we also received a grant from uh, United Way in conjunction with, uh, not yet, we, we, we'll go back to it, <clears throat> in conjunction with the public health department and we received $11,000 grant for students from the medical school at the University of Illinois to help sanitize polling locations uh, in 2020. Uh, in 2021, we can move to the, so we bought 60 express votes. You can stay there for a second. We bought 60 more express votes, and that's when the $200,000 came from uh, the county so that we could purchase those. And then we also, uh, we put together some instructional videos for individuals who wanted, for voters who wanted to watch and see how to vote by mail, how to vote in person, how to use the express vote uh, for individuals, for, for people in our community who have disabilities. We, we uh, purchased those videos, they are up on the website right now, and that was a $5,200 purchase. Let me bring my water. <clears throat> okay, so in 2022, now we can move to the Agilis. So we, one thing that we should celebrate, uh, that we're happy about, <clears throat> is the successful merger of the county recorder's office into the clerk's office, which of course is going to save taxpayers money. <clears throat> I gotta get some water. Yes, I have a bottle right over there. <clears throat> so uh, the merger is some of the savings that we have. <clears throat> but with the ARPA funds, we also were able to buy the Agilis that you see there. Thank you so much. Yeah. But we were able to buy that one for, it was a $250,000 purchase. <clears throat> so those are some of the things I just wanted to highlight for you all. <sighs> what we were able to purchase with uh, the funding from the county, but also with the, the grant funds that we brought in to modernize our elections and to offer a, a certain level of election security. And you all will notice, uh, some of you may have seen the article in the newspaper that talked about all the work that we've done to to bring forth the security uh, for our elections, for our local elections. One of the other things that we've been able to do is partner with local businesses. So we have been able to partner with uh, Papa Dale's, Black Dog, Sailfin, Wooden Hog, Custard Cup, and what they are doing is whenever someone comes in for an order to, to deliver or to do a pickup order, they're stapling these pluggers to their outgoing uh, bags or whatever it is that they purchase so that the individuals will see the four easy steps to vote by mail, register to vote, request a vote by mail ballot, complete the ballot, and return it in a, uh, by mail or in one of the drop boxes. There's a scan uh, or here to check, a scan uh, QR code, what do you call it, <laughs> here to check the registration and to request your ballot also with the dates of the elections on there. So that's been pretty exciting and, and really successful so far. So again, I just wanted to thank you all for all of your support. When we started this conversation in 2019, there was a long way to go for the clerk's office, but we have been able to modernize the clerk's office and bring it up to in the, in the current uh, century and make sure that we have what we need to run fair for uh, having one or two missing. I believe the Muhammad Library is the one that is missing from the list that we sent over uh, to you all to, to review. Um, uh, that would be... Can I open it? Aaron, do you, do you know uh, do you know what the locations and the precincts are? The one uh, that right I'm now? sure of is the Muhammad Library that should have been okay. added to that list, and it is not on the list. All right. Um, there appears to be some sort of change from what we sent over to what you all actually received. Okay. Um, so I mean, I, I suppose we could pull it and then just have this as new business on the full board meeting uh, with the corrections made. Yeah, I would, I would think we would need to vote on a correct document. Is there any questions for the clerk? No, I'm also, I'm Jen. sorry. Sorry, I just want to say thank you for pulling all this together. Um, as somebody who has worked elections since 2016, I think was the first one I did, so with your predecessor, um, 
I'm just really excited about the new voter assistance terminal or the old voter assistance terminals being gone because that was what you likened to the, what was it, the 100 pound pencil? Um, they were useless, they did not work. And more often than not, we ended up pulling election judges to assist people with voting by hand, um, which took away from everybody else who was trying to vote at the precinct. So congratulations on, on getting all this pulled together. It looks fantastic, I'm excited to vote. Well, thank you. One of the things that was really exciting about that whole process is that we had individuals come in who, for the first time, who had a, whether they were vision impaired or had some other disability, were able to use the machine privately and independently and not have to have a Democrat and a Republican go sit with them and know who they're voting for and read things off to them. So this was something that I think the entire county can be proud of and congratulate ourselves for, for making sure that we create this type of accessibility for, for all our voters. Now, I'm happy to share, I brought information about the polling locations and why we are moving in the way that we're moving. If it, I think it's probably best for me to share some of that now. I won't be here next week. Uh, Andrew or Michelle would be able to present the, follow, the, uh, the final pieces of the polling locations, but I do have some information to share with you all about why we, are walk, why we chose the, the locations the way we did, if that's okay. Okay. Mr. Summers? Just a comment. Um, in listening to all of the changes that have been instituted in the clerk's office, I'm struck by the real need for all county departments to continually be looking at updating and moving with the times, replacing outdated equipment. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's been extraordinarily difficult for Clerk Ammons because there were so many pieces that really needed to be replaced. And I know our county's been hamstrung by a lack of financial uh, means to make these improvements, but it's imperative across all department lines to try and continually update. The idea that we had laptops that had software that is no longer being serviced um, just is kind of blows my mind. Anyway, uh, a lot of work, uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Are you still in need of election judges? Yes, we do still need election judges. We are. We actually just had a voter education series where we had a nice conversation with uh, Tammy Fruling Vogues from St. Uh, St. Joe. She was talking about uh, speaking with Dee Schockweiler and some of the other folks on the Republican side to, to get more election judges. That is where the biggest bulk of our shortage is. Uh, but certainly we're looking forward to a, a commission judges coming from both sides, from both parties. Do, do we? Do we uh, use any equipment from Dominion Voting? We do not use any equipment from Dominion Voting. ES and S is our vendor. Wait, well, you're gonna get sued. <laughs> um, I do have one more question. Um, do, do you have a, a total of, of the grants? That, do you have a total number? Yes, it's 1.4 million that we received in grant funding since we took over. Some of that funding was already, uh, it was a recurring piece that was about $150,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, outside of that recurring number is the, the amount that we were bring, able to bring in outside of what was normally coming in. And, most and, and we also took full advantage of what, uh, what the 150000 because it was not being used uh, in, in, in full capacity when we came in. And, and most of that brought like permanent equipment that we'll be able to keep forever. Oh right? yes, this is our equipment. The, most of the equipment that we have, of course we have two elections a year, may, sometimes just one if we don't have a primary. So uh, when I look at the uh, sorter, I think that's a machine that we can easily count on having for 20 years. Uh, the express votes the same way. The DS200s are extremely durable. They are, we have maintenance agreements, so they are always maintenance. We haven't had uh, very many problems with those, so they are all updated. And we're going to have uh, the, uh, the maintenance people from es and come out next month to do a full upgrade of all the equipment. So I, I believe that everything that we have purchased will be around for quite a while. Laptops, you know, that, that kind of comes and goes. You're not going to be on. using Windows 11 in 15 years? Uh, we probably won't be using Windows 11 in 15 years. No, we will not. Um, so it is a lot. It's a lot of information and a lot of work that we've done. The election judge training manuals are now online for people to go and see those and study the election judge manuals. So I, I'm very proud of all the work that we have done over the last three years. Uh, amidst a pandemic 
we were still able to boast the highest turnout in the history of Champaign County and to have everyone be able to cast their ballots safely and securely, whether they did so by mail or did so in person. So just quickly on, on the polling locations, am I free to, to present that quickly? Yes? Yeah, please. All right. So you all also may recall that I sent out a, a proposed early voting schedule and locations on Tuesday, April 5th of this year. I think I sent it to the entire board. So when I took over the clerk's office in 2018, we had 10 early voting sites, and I increased it to 12 for the 2020 and 2021 election cycles. The plan now is to add an additional 17 locations throughout the county for a total of 29 universal or vote center locations. The early voting locations and schedules are in direct response to the will of the voters. Based upon the growing increase in early voting and vote by mail, I decided to increase the number of places where voters can cast their votes early throughout Champaign County. So our data shows that 5% of voters in 2012 voted early and 3% voted by mail. I think I have this on this slide. Let me see. <laughs> there it is. All right. So uh, again, in 2012, we had uh, our data shows that the, let me make sure I'm in my right spot here. Our data shows that 5% of the voters in 2012 voted early and 3% voted by mail. In 2012, 3,476 people voted early and 2,442 voted by mail. In 2016, 19,952 people voted early and 6,161 people voted by mail. So prior to, uh, to COVID, we can see what the voters are asking for in, from 2012 to 2016 a big jump from a 16,000 uh, voter increase in early voting and a four, almost a 4,000 increase uh, in vote by mail. Then in 2020, uh, with the growing trends already uh, coupled with COVID, we had 41,830 people who voted early and 28,151 who voted by mail. And during those same elections, the percentage of people who voted at a precinct polling location, a precinct base location uh, dropped each election. We went from 92% in 2012, 92% of the people voted in, in 2012, they voted at their home precinct, uh, to 72% in 2016, down to 20% in 2020. So uh, you could argue that 2020 was an anomaly maybe, uh, but one cannot dispute the significant increase of early voting and vote by mail from 2012 to 2016. So furthermore, one of the impacts of COVID-19 is that voters are more informed about ways to vote than ever before. When I add to that reality, the amount of voter education and outreach we've done since I took office, it's clear that once voters have experienced the ease and flexibility of voting early or voting by mail, most will never go back to the rigid process of voting on one day between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m at one prescribed location. While I agree that we should not look at early voting of 2020 and expect 44% of the voters to vote early this year, by that same token, we can't expect the number to fall back to 21% from 2016. The reality is somewhere in between. The voting trend data tells us in 2020 that percentage-wise, the increase in early voting and vote by mail were both 23% and 22% respectively. During that same period and same elections, the precinct-based voting decreased from 92% to 20%. As a caveat, on election day in 2020, of the 26,024 people who voted, 6,344 voters chose a universal location, aka vote center, instead of their precinct-based location to cast their votes. To be clear, of the 96,000 people who voted, less than 20,000 voted at their precinct-based location. Eight years prior, 77,000 people voted at their precinct-based location. I just wanted to paint a very clear picture to the board that the voting trends of the voters is what's driving my decisions to increase early voting access, as well as preparing for the increasing interest and participation of vote by mail. So that was sort of a prelude that I had to why we chose the locations that we chose and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you, I had a few of them. Um, I guess I'll go back over some of the stuff you, and comments um, from the beginning with all the voting machines and the process and the uh, improvement that we've had 
I think you've done a great job with that. Um, we didn't provide the funding in the past to be able to do that, but we have, um, I, I think, a good system. You have pr pr provided a good system, um, improved the system, the ability for people to vote, and I think that's always important. I think we all do. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I think things may change a little bit um, as COVID uh, goes, gets behind us on our voting, um, except that I, I think early voting, I think they really do appreciate it, the opportunity to go and vote early. Um, and, but I also think there's a portion of the population that really wants to vote in their home precinct. Um, and I see the list again of um, available precinct or voting locations in the smaller towns has, has um, shrunk again. Uh, I realize that the folks in town, you know, they, they can run home, pick up their kids uh, from work and go vote um, and make it by seven o'clock. But if you have to drive out to Penfield or someplace else, it becomes a little bit more difficult. I know you don't want to try, I, I know you don't want to keep people from voting, but uh, I'd like to see us look at and find out why those locations um, aren't currently remaining on the list of available uh, precincts to vote. Um, uh, two more things that maybe you can address for me, please. And some of it is probably just um, information and people have asked me questions about. Um, I've had a couple people sign on to try to sign up to be election judges. I don't know if it's the uh, mentioned IT issues, not blaming the IT person, but um, the, but they've had a problem trying to sign up to be election judges or a response, and I don't know if that's IT, you know, something happening in the office, too busy, whatever, but I want to make sure that, as you said, we, we want to make sure we have as many election judges as possible. Uh, the other thing that happened and I heard about in the last election uh, was some of the new machines or the way that the, um, the people just don't understand when they run their ballot through the uh, tabulator that if they haven't voted for something, it's going to kick it out um, or may kick it out. I'm not sure how you're setting them. Sometimes it's set one way or, or it could be the other way. And I, and I think that's an instructions thing that, that some people felt like they were told, no, you have to vote for that person. You have to vote in that race when in reality, obviously, they don't have to. So um, you can address those issues or address them on your own, however you like to handle it. Thank you. All right, thank you for the questions, Jim. I'll just start from the last one. The express vote machine is the, uh, the newest machine I think that you're referring to. We had some conversations with folks around that. Uh, this is actually nothing new. I went back to and read through some of the instructions and some of the programming of my predecessors, and they also had situations or had um, the same screen that would come up to say, hey, if you wanted to, you could have voted for this person. You recognize that you left this blank, and the person has the option to proceed and, and go ahead and cast their ballot, or they can hit a button and return, and it will return their ballot to them. Then they can go and fill in the oval for the candidate of their choice. So that is nothing new. Um, so the machine, because the express vote is a, a machine that can be used by any voter, now we had more than just our uh, population of individuals with uh, disabilities using the machine. So I think it was a, a little new to some of them because they had never seen that machine before. And the machine has a check mark if you vote for the office, and it has an exclamation point if you don't. So uh, there was some, I guess, confusion for some voters or a handful of voters. The other folks didn't have a problem with it. So we, 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 uh, we acknowledge that. And one of the videos that we have made, it's a professionally done video, it's really nice. People can see the entire process from A to Z with the express vote, so there's a lot of education there. I'm in the process of doing voter education series, and I'm, I'm, the express vote is one of the things that we're talking about. We have it set up in our office right now on the counter for anyone who wants to come in and play with it. Try it out, use it so that you can see how it works. It is actually, um, when we start talking about the next phases of technology and increasing, this machine is just a marking device, like the 100-pound pencil, but it only weighs like 19 pounds, so it's a lot easier to move around. But it's just a marking device, and it spits back a ballot for you to, to look at and to, to make sure that it's what you want. So this, this machine actually, in some places, in some states, 
It is what fills the entire room when you go in to vote instead of a regular booth where you uh, fill in the ovals. They only have those machines. So it is that, uh, that it's in that high of a demand and that uh, efficient of a machine because you don't have to use the big ballots and things like that. It's much more efficient. So that's just to, to address the express vote. We are doing some education around that. We appreciate it if you help amplify that message. All right. Uh, people signing up to be election judges. I get questions like this, whether I'm on WDWS or wherever, and people come up with a, a, a scenario, but they don't give me the specifics. It's very difficult for me to answer a question like that without the specific individual or the specific issue. If someone's calling our office to be an election judge or to sign up to be an election judge, we want them to be an election judge. We need the flexibility of making sure we have the correct ratios. Uh, but for everyone to understand that I have to run the election and I can't close a polling location because I don't have uh, the correct ratio. If only Republicans show up, then there'll be only Republican judges. If only Democrats show up, then there'll be only Democratic judges. Yeah. Uh, so then the, the shrinking rural areas, uh, you might look at both of those and see that there's, uh, it's not just the rural areas, right? So um, there was Florida Avenue Residence Hall. There are other places that we've looked at that are either not ADA compliant or they didn't want to be uh, a polling location anymore. We had several different reasons why we made those adjustments. But in places like Muhammad, we have three locations in Muhammad, two early voting locations in Muhammad. And also in all those rural areas, I, I keep saying this, I, I said it to Ms. Michaels earlier, we certainly, I'd be happy to mail you your ballot and you won't have to go anywhere. You can just mail it straight from your home or go drop it in a drop box. But we're definitely trying to make sure that we get um, the access in the rural areas. I heard you loud and clear when you talked about early voting. So you've heard me do a presentation about early voting here tonight. Uh, and you all are well aware of the drop boxes that I'm trying to put even in the rural areas in the places that will accept them. So you know what I mean? All right. Just address that. You remind me. He said he was trying to put his license plate number in, and then at the last four, uh, so and it, it confused that. No, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. So what's happening is on the screen, when an individual goes to sign up for vote by mail in particular, and it may be even for the election judge as well, you put your name, first and last name in, and then the last four of your social security. And it says, or driver's license, and everybody's doing both, and then they wonder why they can't, uh, they can't proceed. It's just one or the other. That's what the problem is. Okay. Thanks for the question. Mr. Williams? I can't imagine that anyone would not want or be accommodating of a drop box. Have you you've had uh, resistance? Yes. Uh, so what I thought was a very clear and easy thing in uh, the four or five rural areas, because I wanted to, we did drive and drops at first in St. Joe, ran to Tolono, and Muhammad. And we got a wonderful response in all those locations. We, I heard what was coming from the, uh, the Republican side of the aisle, that we should have drop boxes for everyone. I ordered the drop boxes. I thought it was a no-brainer. Uh, no one has to pay uh, for the boxes. It was a grant uh, money that we used. The places that we put them, whether that's Muhammad, Rantoul, uh, St. Joe, the, the municipality does not have to pay for the box. They don't have to maintenance the box. They don't have to empty the boxes. They don't have to do anything. but let the box be in a location that is probably not used for much of anything. So yes, I went out to Tolono. I met with Mayor Murphy. We had a very clear understanding about a drop box in a big open gravel area in front of his office. Uh, we picked out the location. Uh, it was all set. We sent them the intergovernmental agreement. Then all of a sudden, things start to change. And I, I don't know what happened, but I didn't get any questions. I sent them an email and said, hey, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. You have about 1,300 voters, 353 of them voted by mail. It's about 18 to 20 percent. I think it will be a good idea for your voters. I never heard anything back from, from uh, Mr. Murphy or any members of the board. So that is the only location. Tolono is the only location that has dis decided not to have it. We had a similar situation in Savoy, but uh, Mayor John Brown, or village, is he a village president, uh, changed uh, uh, made some maneuvers, basically talked to some other members, and they said, hey, we think it would be a good idea to have one in Savoy. Uh, Mayor Smythe and Rantoul was supportive. They chose the location. I wanted it at the youth center. He said, hey, we'd rather have it at the municipal, bu municipal building. said, okay, no problem. That's where we'll put it. So Mr. Well, everybody's been on board so far except Tolono. Just a comment. Um, 
voter trends change over time, and perhaps COVID did have a very large influence on the reduction in people voting in individual polling places. But if this continues, I think that we do need to at least consider vote centers as former County Clerk Holton had indicated when he was in office. I think we just need to continue to look at the data and then make a decision that's best for all Champaign County residents. Thank you. Kyle? Yeah, and I guess just a, uh, my two cents on the uh, trends, because obviously, you know, we had those big, big numbers uh, for vote by mail influence, but, you know, there's a pandemic. Um, but I think that one kind of overarching thing that the pandemic did to us, kind of in all aspects of society, is it forced us to utilize technology and utilize different capabilities um, that we haven't explored before. And while, you know, we might not have as many Zoom meetings in years moving forward in different aspects of life, we're certainly going to have more than we had beforehand. And I think with vote by mail, it kind of opened people's eyes to, oh, this is actually really convenient. So we might not pull those same numbers, but I think it's, like you said, I don't think it's ever going to go back to where it was before. Sam? Thank you. One thing about data, it don't lie. Those numbers are the truth and the reason for. I know moving um, through the pandemic drove some of those numbers, but I think just a trend of change and um, voter accessibility um, is crucial. Um, in 2020, my mother um, went through a, a, a amputation and she was very vocal at the nursing home about getting her her voters, um, her voting in for the, the uh, election. So I thought that that was amazing that even though she was unable to walk and go anywhere, she was still able to vote. Um, thank you for your hard work and um, your staff. I, I really do thank you for um, upgrading the county so that we can stay um, on top of what's going on with the vote by mail election system. So thank you so very much. I just quickly, um, I do want to say that to that end, I am very proud of the work that I have done and certainly with the, the staff and what they've done. And we've received national attention from the Denver Post, the, the uh, Time Magazine. But just in the state of Illinois, we were the first county to have drop boxes in the state of Illinois. My colleagues are, and from the Clerk and Recorders Association, although we don't always see eye to eye, they, have, uh, they are coming to me and coming to Champaign County saying, okay, where did you get your drop boxes from? Where did you get your sorting machine from? You know, how, how do I make this next step? So we are indeed leading uh, in Illinois, for sure, and, and it feels good to have Champaign County representing like that. Jim? I guess a couple questions. Um, the discussion with Tolono and their drop boxes, I understood from the article that uh, the rest of the board had, had an issue with the location and there was an email sent. Um, I don't know if there's just a communication problem here um, just to say it's Tolono, um, we, we should revisit that but see what the, what the issue really was because it, the, as represented in the paper and the people talking about it, that they tried to contact you um, and there wasn't a response. That's not true. And, and, and um, I guess we just want to make an issue out of it. But um, going on back to voting and voting preferences, which we don't know what will happen with voting after COVID. I personally vote in the vote center early. I think mail-in voting is good. Um, and, and, but there's a lot of people that still want to vote in their home poll polling place on election day. And they don't necessarily understand mail-in voting, don't, you know, don't trust it, those things. And unfortunately, those are more, more rural voters, more Republican voters, and um, when they don't have an opportunity to vote in their homes, towns, like they have in the past, and we shrink down the number of polling places, I, 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 I think we're not giving them the opportunity to vote or have an opportunity to vote, whether we think it's the right way to vote or not. So I just want to say that, first of all, I want to clarify this situation. I'm moving everything in the clerk's office based upon the will and the clear trends of the voters. I'm not having or losing sleep personally if someone disagrees with me or doesn't agree with the approach that I'm using in, from the clerk's office for voting. 
uh, I want to put to bed this notion with Tolono that somehow my office did not communicate clearly. I initiated the conversation. There are several email exchanges. Mr. Murphy agreed to the Dropbox, and we sent the intergovernmental agreement. If there was any change that needed to be made, as I alluded to earlier, in Rantoul and Savoy, initially in Savoy, I uh, talked to Mr. Walton. We thought the location would be one place. They wanted it someplace else. No problem. When I talked to Mayor Smith uh, in Rantoul, I wanted it to be in front of the the youth center because they have a driveway. He said, hey, we'd prefer to have it over here, as well as uh, uh, Trustee Kreider and Hall said the same thing. So that's where it's at. So it's clearly demonstrated that I have no problem accommodating the wishes of the individuals who run those towns or the elected officials there. And so if there was any desire from the members of Tolono, their board, or the, the, the village uh, mayor there to make any changes, all they had to do was say, we'd rather have it in point A instead of point B. But you can hear from their comments, they later start saying outrageous things about people pouring stuff in the boxes and all that kind of different stuff. So I don't want to get into a back and forth about that. I think it's pretty clear that there was something else going on in Tolono, and they didn't want the drop box there. But that's their decision, and their voters would deal with them about that. Now, you, you keep saying, uh, you keep going back to the Republican areas or the more rural areas um, not having access. What I tried to demonstrate through my presentation is that whether it's Colorado, Utah, Oregon, any of these places, as vote by mail increases and early voting increases, early voting takes place in specific locations. You don't typically open up early voting in all of the precinct-based locations. So when you have over we we had 41, we almost had 76 or 77 percent of the voting uh, turnout be through early voting because vote by mail is a form of early voting. So vote by mail and early voting dominated that. So I can't continue to waste the taxpayers' dollars by opening up locations um, all throughout the county where two people show up and we spend. Sometimes we're talking about a thousand dollars for the election judges. The equipment, a tabulator is $5,500. A express vote is $3,500. We have to pay people to deliver the, the, uh, the equipment out there. So sometimes you're talking about a $10,000, sometimes $20,000 investment of taxpayer dollars into a polling location. And if we have a much more efficient way, and the trends show that this is how the voters want to vote, then I think it's, at some point we have to move in that direction. But I am not going to allow voter suppression to take place in the rural areas or in the urban areas. I believe in democracy, and I'm going to make sure that everyone has access to vote. Well, I won't go back to the Tolono issue. Um, but the issue that 30 percent of the voters still want to vote on Election Day and in their polling places, that's no, the, I'm clerk's sorry. the clerk's office dictating where they can vote and that they want them to vote by mail and they want them to vote early. and that's not something the clerk's office should be doing. No, we should, I, we're I here to you. represent uh, uh, our constituents, and they tell us that they should have access. They don't want to have to drive an hour to go vote after they get off work in another city, um, and it seems like more and more of them are closing in the rural So, areas. Jim, I want to say that um, I agree with you, and whenever I talk about vote-by-mail early voting, it never means that there would be uh, that we're going to do away with precinct-based locations completely. There will be changes for some people, but that happens all the time. When COVID came, we lost 11 polling locations. Two of them we lost the night before the location, uh, before the vote, before the uh, election. So polling places change all the time. And then we're re required to send information to the voter to say, hey, this is your new polling location. And I understand that it may be inconvenient for some people, but it's, in it's always inconvenient for someone, Jim because a polling location may be on the outskirts of your precinct and you may live on way on the other side. So now if you are forced to vote at a precinct-based location, you have to drive all the way across your precinct to get to the location while somebody might live next door to it and all they have to do is walk out their back door and go vote. So it's not going to be the same for everyone no matter what happens. So I have to look at a, a large, uh, the trends and look at what the data is saying and it's telling me, the voters are telling me, they want vote centers, they want universal locations, and they want to vote by mail. 
and some of them do want to vote in their precinct locations. And then the last point on this is even when you hear of a state, if any of you hear of a state that says we've gone all vote by mail, it does not mean that they don't have precinct-based locations or in-person voting. There is still a percentage of in-person or precinct-based uh, voting that takes place even in a state that's all vote by mail, okay? Nobody, and Jim, nobody's driving an hour in Champaign County to go vote. Please don't, don't, don't polarize this like that. See, Jim, and this is where I think that the voters have responsibility and have some agency because you can't drive past 12 early voting locations and six drop boxes and then complain that you didn't have a, a polling location across the street from your house. At some point, we have to say that there's a requirement uh, for us all to evolve with the technology and the times. So we, we have to have, there has to be so some So there's going to be a requirement to vote in Champaign rather than the rural areas is what you're saying. No, Jim, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Ms. King, okay. Ms. Lockshin. Okay, just a quick clarification. And I know that you said you'd already sent this out, but um, you did say earlier that there's an expansion in the universal and early voting as well. Right. How many of those will be in rural and outer areas? So I would, let me see if I can pull up a few of these for you. Let's say, for instance, um, Muhammad used to have one early voting location, and it was a 14 day. A location. We also have added a three-day location. So we're going to be 40 days at Brookings, where we can vote here at Brookings for 40 days, 14 days in 11 different locations throughout Champaign County, and that's including Tolono, Rantoul, Muhammad, and St. Joe, our early voting locations that stay open for 14 days. And then, like Muhammad, we'll have another one that's a three-day location. In Rantoul, we'll have another three-day location. So we have other places that are going to be in the rural areas as well as in, inside the uh, urban areas where early voting will be increased and increase the access for, for voters who are in the rural areas as well. Okay, and what, what does a three-day location mean? So that means that it'll be open for uh, early voting for three days. I, you don't, I don't have the funding to open all... Right sites for 14 days, so we've staggered them mm -hmm. in such a way so that there will be early voting options at, at several different times. Okay, so it's not like the three days before the election, it would be, we're going to have early voting at this location? No, it's three days in a row, uh -huh. we, because yeah, yeah. that's too much work. I can't oh, yeah. stagger those like that, but what I mean is 40, 14, 3, and then some locations for one day, because, and, and just so that you all understand, the, the magnitude and the, the stress sometimes of trying to open up uh, all these voting locations at one time at 5 o'clock in the morning. And you have 300 to 400 different judges who are all trying to open up locations. The phones ring constantly. It's a pretty stressful time for everyone. So what we've tried to do is limit that by opening some of those locations three days early or one day early to accommodate the desires for early voting, as well as to ease the transition for the election judges who are picking up the next day, and so we don't have so much, uh, it won't be a, a sort of chaotic time early in the morning, and a stressful time for the voters or for our staff. Do we have any more questions for the clerk? Thank you very much. All right, thank you all for the questions. I appreciate your time. Uh, we are now moving back to D. Uh, we, br we briefly mentioned in uh, C2 a uh, workforce study uh, update, and my information is that is in progress. Is that correct? <clears throat> Kyle, would you like to take D other business? Um. Should we take a formal step on the polling places? Because I don't think we technically moved. Oh, we're good. Everybody, we're fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, blah, 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 sorry. Uh, I move to establish, uh, uh, or move a resolution establishing and appointing members to the Champaign County Community Violence Prevention Task Force. Uh, those members will be Kyle Patterson, Stephanie Furtado, Samantha Carter. Oh, sorry. Uh, Kyle Patterson, Stephanie Furtado, Samantha Carter, Aaron Esri, Jenny Lockshin, 
Tim McGuire and Diane Michaels. So moved, Rob. Second, Summers. Um, All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. And I believe you have a statement regarding closed sessions. Uh, I move to follow the state's attorney's recommendation to open the closed session minutes to, of, uh, I'm sorry, it's late. I move to follow the state's attorney's recommendation to open the closed minutes of September 21st, 2004, and for all other closed session minutes to remain closed. I'll second. Kyle's first, Ms. Lockshin the second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, Dr. Storr did not forward me a chair's report. Designation of items for the consent agenda, correct me if I'm wrong, would be 2A through P and C1. C1 to the committee, so 2A through P, thank you very much. That concludes policy personnel and appointments. All right. Um, for other business, we just have the announcement. Just a reminder that there is a uh, study session on April 26th at 6 p.m. Um, and I believe that it's going to be on the topic of uh, small business investment um, that we can use ARPA funds towards. All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, seeing no other business, uh, call this meeting adjourned.